Ahoy! Ahoy! Good morning. Ahoy, everybody. We, <laughs> this is a day I've been waiting for, for almost all the whole book of Job. Actually, ever since chapter 3 of the book of Job. Oh, man. Yeah. We got, you know what? Oh, I told you. Wouldn't be the last time you hear from the greatest American novel of all time. We're going to, we're actually not going to talk about him today. <laughs> uh, but he has been called, the whale has been called the Leviathan before. And the, the beast of the land is called the behemoth. And both of those will make an appearance for us today in the book of Job. Uh, we are on chapters 40 and 41. This is the second part of God's God has finally appeared to Job and given him exactly what he prayed for, a hearing and an answer, right? Last time we looked at the first part, and uh, the Lord's answer is not really what we expect at all. He just asks more questions, but better questions, right? You call those questions? I got some questions for you. Uh, and so we're going to continue that in the second half of the Lord's response. Uh, and we're gonna get, the Lord is going to provide two examples of something in the land and in the sea that is exactly what God is talking about. You can't answer any of this. You know nothing about this. You have no power over these things. So, um, I, I, But I am the one with the power who created these things. I am the one who knows all of these details. Uh, and so that's by inference then. God, God created all things, sees all things, knows all things then also Job understands God created me. He sees me. He knows me. He searches for me. And he has redeemed me as well with my Redeemer, my mediator, right? All right, so this is, this is where we'll go. We only have two more days of the book of Job today and, Lord willing, next week. We're going to close it up next week. Wow. What a long, strange trip it's been. I know. Praise God. Uh, why don't we join together, open this Bible study with prayer, asking for the Lord's blessing. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this marvelous word that you've given us in the book of Job. And we pray that you would use it to nurture our faith, our trust in you, that you do know all things, that our times are in your hands, and that you have plans only to prosper us in eternity and that all things in this world do work out for our spiritual good, our eternal good, uh, because you have done everything to ensure that that spiritual good is ours in heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you also for this beautiful world that you've created for us and all the mysteries that we, we can't understand. We can only just apprehend. We can only see. And we pray that you would continue to, uh, to marvel us with your creation, with your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so yeah, let's get into it. Oh, man, wow. I spent so much time anticipating this day that now I have no idea what to say when I get here. You know, the, uh, the philosophers used to say that mankind is happiest when anticipating future happiness. You know, we're happiest not in the moment of happiness, but when we're planning for future happiness. And I think that's true. Yep. Yeah. It's like, oh man, I'm going to take this vacation. It's going to be awesome. And you get there and then there's other people around and it's like, you missed your flight. And it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. All right, but regardless, we have, uh, we have to work with what the, the, the time that God gives us. So today, chapters 40 and 41 conclude the Lord's response, talking about behemoth and Leviathan specifically. And then next week, Job chapter 42. Uh, this is the conclusion of the book of Job. We've been asking all these questions about suffering, about life, the universe, and everything. And now the answer is 42, right? Chapter 42, the end of the book of Job. Uh, that's it for all you who are going to celebrate Towel Day this month, at the end of this month. That's a little joke for you, 42. <laughs> Uh, all right, so, and we will see Job at the end of things is restored by God as well. So, the, here we, we, we talked earlier in chapter 28 about wisdom, Job's speech about wisdom, the benefit of wisdom, seek wisdom, get wisdom, fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. That was at the heart of the book, right, in the middle, that's the point, 
That's the real treasure. That's the bullseye, right? Here in the middle of the Lord's response, we've heard the first part. Now, at the beginning of chapter 40, we have the heart, we have the bullseye. This is the whole point of what God is saying, right? That's sort of the way Hebrew poetry, Hebrew thought works. It doesn't have a summary at the beginning or the end, like we would expect. It often has the summary, the conclusion, right in the middle, so that you have to work through everything else in order to get to it, right? That's great. Uh, It deals a lot with mystery and (laughs) and enigma, that sort of thing. So we'll read chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. God has just concluded his first speech about all the animals in the world, the living creation you don't understand and have no power over. Chapter 40, verse 1. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I repay you? How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Uh, okay, so that, <laughs> that's the answer to Job's prayers, actually. He wants an audience with God. He wants to make his complaint known. It might have surprised him at that time to learn this is the answer he's looking for. I'm going to shut up, right? I'm going to put my hand over my mouth uh, because I am unworthy. That's a very good word. We'll talk about that one. Um, actually, let's talk about it right now. The, <laughs> the Lord said to Job, the one who contends, who quarrels, who bickers, who nitpicks, right, who complains against the Almighty. Are you going to correct the Almighty, right? The one who accuses God, who acts as a prosecutor, you know, who prosecutes God will... You answer God with, for what God has done, right? Um, that's the heart of the matter. And Job answers the Lord, I am unworthy. That word means, I don't, I don't know if unworthy is really very the best translation because it's not about worth. It's about size, I guess. It's, he's small. He's trifling. He's inconsequential. I'm nothing. I'm this, like, just this little dot compared to everything you've just shown me in your word, in your creation. What is man, you know, that you pay attention to him and son of man that you love him? Um, Meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless, right? Except the word of the Lord. So searching for, Job started searching for justice outside of God's grace, right? He wanted to be justified. He was concerned about God's justice. This isn't fair But he started thinking about God giving him justice without God giving him grace, too. And that's what leads him to this point. I'm inconsequential. Justice without God's grace, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's insignificant. He was searching for knowledge of God, right? To ask him and get a reason why from God. But he was doing so without the wisdom that he was seeking. So knowledge that is outside of and apart from God's wisdom, is inconsequential. It's nothing. It rises up and then it fades. It passes. And nobody cares. So that's Job's friends too, right? They have all this knowledge. They list all these things. They say all these platitudes. They don't have any wisdom. And what are they? We'll we'll hear about that from God next week. Um, Job's real problem, where he really went wrong, chapter 31, Uh, when his words were ended, his final case, he starts justifying himself. I am righteous. I maintain that because of all the things I have done, because all the sins I have not done. That is why I'm righteous. That is why I demand justice from God. Doing that, justifying himself apart from God, makes him nothing, right? 1 Corinthians 13, right? If I have all these great things, if I can preach, if I have the words of angels, if I can sing, if I have everything and have not love, the love of God, the grace of God, I'm nothing, nothing. My life, everything I am, my whole being just clangs like a cymbal and then it's gone forever, right? So without God, Job actually, in fact, would be nothing, right? Without God, all of us would be nothing. We'd be formless and void, right? We think uh, Adam is made from clay. That's true. He's made from the ground. Um, But really, what's the ground made from? Nothing, 
I mean, God made it with his word, right? His word, he speaks and it happens. But it's made from nothing. Before creation, everything is formlessness, void, emptiness. We can't even imagine what that is. It's so empty and nothing. And that, that's really what we all would be without God creating us and preserving us in this moment. Um, in him we live, we move, we have our being, we exist. In him, we can't exist apart from him. When we try to do that, to seek justice, to seek uh, love, to seek knowledge, all apart from God's grace and his justification, we make ourselves nothing. Um, one thing I love, this is an idea I came across in an old book. The guy, uh, Thomas Aquinas is great. Don't try to, I mean, he's, oof. He was called the, the dumb ox, the mute ox. Uh, because he was a big guy, but very, very quiet, and just an absolute genius. Didn't get everything right, but genius. And he had this idea that I really love. He said, because God ex is existence, he said, God is I am, that I am. He exists and is existence. He created all existence. The closer we are to God through Jesus Christ, the more fully we exist. I love that. We become less than human. We become less than existent when we are not connected to God through Jesus Christ. He's our creator, right? He's the whole reason we're here. He's our preserver, our redeemer. He's the whole reason we'll be with him in eternity. So the more we remove ourselves from being connected to God through his word, through the sacraments, the less we exist. The more we are inconsequential, nothing, right? And the sad thing is, people prefer that, to do that on purpose. Yeah, but Lord have mercy. There's my clicker, okay. Uh, so the, the, the midpoint of the, yes, the midpoint of the Lord's response here, we heard his first part in chapters 38, 39. Now here's the heart of it, and these are the main, this is the main idea, right? Will you correct God when you complain against him? And Job says, I was trying to do that, and I'm nothing. I'm sorry. Uh, I, it's your word, God, so I put my hand over my mouth, right? Um, yes, you, you, God is saying, you quarrel, you find fault with the Almighty. Okay, so how, how will you correct me, right? What will you, what will you, what's your idea to make it better without making it worse for you or anyone else, Right? Uh, you accuse me, you accuse, accuse God of being unfair. Okay, well, what's your answer? What's your reasoned, fair solution to all of this? Once again, without hurting you or anyone else. You know, that's, that's the humbling part of this, right? Is maybe I didn't know what I was talking about. Ooh, that's so humbling. And so Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? This is... I mean, this is like the significance of what Job is getting at here. God has just laid out all of creation to him, and in particular the whole world and everything he cannot understand or know or have power over. And Job, you know, this is this old idea. Here's the Milky Way, and you are here, right? You're just this little, little third rock from the sun on this sort of backwater of a, of a galaxy among, well, I, uh, I don't know the exact number, billions and billions, I think Carl Sagan said, of galaxies out there. Um, but that's not the end, right? That's not the end of the story. This is us apart from God. We are nothing, insignificant. But with God, we are here, but we are also here, right? The, I tried to go with the, the ripples of the galaxy, with the ripples of water, right? In baptism, he brings us into eternity as well. He makes us his own. We are directly connected to Jesus Christ, our salvation, with Jesus' baptism, which means we're connected to his death when he dies, his burial when he's buried, and most important of all, his resurrection. When he's raised on Easter Sunday, we are raised from the dead as well. Uh, and so with, with uh, where am I? Oh. Oh my goodness, what did I, where was I going? Uh, <laughs> Oh, yes, okay, so Job, Job's faith, it, never, it, it falters throughout this book, and we've seen it. It starts off pretty strong, right? What does he confess right away in the moment of crisis? He says, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He praises God when he loses everything. 
When his wife then comes to him and says, curse God and die, he says, well, you're speaking like you're a fool because should we accept only good from God and not trouble? He, he, is, he brings one in the same. And so should, you know, who are we that we should only demand good things from God and always think that something bad happening to us will only harm us and will not bring us something better, right? Um, and that's the, the cross that we bear as Christians. It's, all, it's difficult, right? It's ugly sometimes, but it, it's there to purify our faith like gold, right? Far more precious than gold. So he was good right away, but then I think as, this, as a, the, the immediate crisis went into long-term trauma, right? Time goes on and his friends are not helping. They're just making everything worse. He's isolated. He has no one to help him. He's no one there. Everyone is actually accusing him, saying false things about him. People in, where he lives are making fun of him, he said, right? Because look at how great he was, and now look at him, right? On an ash heap. Um, and so I, I think it's completely understandable how Job's faith could falter, not only with the crisis that he was given in the immediate moment, losing everything, um, and, but then also long-term, if we think about it. Sometimes uh, we, we say time heals all wounds. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it makes wounds fester. Sometimes it gets worse the longer it goes on, right? Uh, and sometimes it doesn't get easier to bear the more time passes, Sometimes it gets harder to bear the longer we have to live with it, right? And I think that's probably what's going on as Job slowly brings his attention away from the God of grace who sent him a redeemer to I am righteous and here's what I did, here's what I didn't do to prove that. And you better listen to me because you're not listening to me, right? Pastor, I think you had the drawing, you know, of when you see Job, not only, I guess he looks so skinny, thin, Nothing like just nothing. Mm, yeah. Really. I mean, even the outward was showing. I mean, wasn't mm -hmm. just his inward was going. I think. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, how those pictures? I mean, I look at those like wow. Yeah. Someone, I mean, someone just having the illness, the disease that Job had, that would be trauma. That's horrific trauma. Like that's a horror in your body all over. Let alone, I lost everything I own. I'm dirt. I'm dirt poor sitting on the ash heap, and more horrible than that, all 10 of my children are dead in a moment. And everybody turned to Yeah, and then your wife says, oh, just curse God and die. And your friends come, and they sit with you in silence, and then as soon as you open your mouth to talk to them about it, uh, to get some sympathy, they say, well, you brought it on yourself, right? <sighs> Man. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that Job's faith yeah. falters. Yes. He's not getting any, you know, encouragement. He's not getting any consolation. He's not getting any direction in the truth. So that's why God needs to step in and give him his word, right, um, directly. Uh, and so I, I think that this, Job needed this reminder of God's grace and presence. He is reduced to nothing, but that doesn't mean he is nothing, right? He does, that doesn't mean he has nothing because God has always been there with him, for him, through it all, in grace. That's the most important part of it, right? Not judgment, not anger, but, but grace, the undeserved love of God. And in the vast, despite the vast cosmos of God's creation that is unsearchable, unknowable, we have no power or control over, all those billions and billions of galaxies we don't know about, we can't, we can't move in the sky. Despite all that, God calls himself God with us. The one who created all of that. I was just looking at the, the night sky the other night. The one who created all of that is right here with us in the water, in the word, in the bread and wine, right? The Lord's Supper. Um, there's a, did anyone see where we were right out our back window last night? When, I don't remember what time it was. Just this huge rainbow across the sky. Did anyone see that? Oh, man. That was awesome. That was awesome. That's God's sign. I'm present with you. I'm caring for you. I don't want to harm you and hurt you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to care for you and get, you know, give you salvation, right? It's a rainbow. It's a bow, right? Like a bow and arrow. Where's the arrow pointing? Is it down at us in condemnation? No, it's up at God. 
Oh, man, God's promise, his Messiah, his Savior is, I come to you, I dwell with you, I suffer for you, I die, so you never will, right? Oh, I mean, that's, yeah, we have the word of God that created all of that, became flesh, human flesh, and lived among us, still lives among us, right? We have, uh, of course, the Lord's Supper. I tried to go with the ripple theme again, you know, like... Uh, I don't know if it worked, but <laughs> the very real true body and blood of Christ for our forgiveness, right? I am unworthy. That's sort of what, when we talk about going to communion, receiving communion worthily, the first step of that is knowing I'm unworthy, right? Being worthy means knowing I'm unworthy. I'm repentant. My only hope of salvation is in you, O oh Lord, and you have given it to me in full right here. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the heart of, of God's speech here, and that's the heart of where Job is at at the end of all this. Uh, okay, so this was the first part we went through. The main question in part one was, do you have perfect knowledge and perfect power over all things? Do you perfectly care for and provide for all things? Of course, no. And God makes the point, I provide not only for the living creation, but the non-living creation too. I keep that in existence. I care for that. Um, the, the, in the mix between non-living and living, he said, uh, do you make, what, uh, grass? Do you, in the dry desert where no one is, no human soul is, do you make the rain fall and grass spring up where no one can see it, where no one is? No, I do, right? I take care of that creation even when there's no human there. If a tree falls in the forest, it makes a sound even if no one's there to hear it, right? Um, and so that was his first part. Now he's gonna, God is going to ask, a different question that Job also needs to hear. Um, oh, do I do that yet? I don't know. Sorry, I'm all mixed up here. God is going to say, do you have perfect knowledge over all things, but do you also have perfect justice? And do you have perfect justification for everything you do? If I look at everything you do, everything you think, everything you say, do you have a perfect justification for all of that? And he sort of leaves him with that question, right? Uh, but God does, right? Um, and so he'll use two examples of this. You don't have perfect knowledge or control. You don't have perfect justification for all you do and make. One is the behemoth, the other is the leviathan, right? But first, uh, this is, so we get to the heart. Job has reached the point where it's like, I get it, Lord, I understand. You revealed it to me, and I know I am unworthy, but yet you are still here with me, dwelling with me. And we'll begin with 40, verse 6. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, storm, brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. We're not done yet, folks. Job gets to the point he needs to be, and we're not done. God says, all right, you wanted this, so gird up your loins. Remember, we, I showed you how to do that last week, if you want to. Uh, gird up your loins, get ready, because we're going to work hard, we're going to fight hard, and I will question you, and you will answer me. Here's some more. Because he needs to get to that point of justice, justification, right? His creation, his power, is not enough. If we have God's power without his grace, if we have his might without his mercy, oh, it's hopeless, right? So we need to get to that justice, justification. Uh, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? That's what Job still needs to hear, you, which is exactly what Job has done, right? He's claimed God is unfair. God is making him his enemy. He's used that, those words. And then in third chapter 31, he justified himself. So would you condemn, God is saying, would you condemn the Holy One to justify yourself? Once again, I think a lot of people actually do this, and that's a scary thought. I was just going to say, yeah. I think that happens. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit, actually. People find fault with God especially with things that happen, and then they try to justify themselves, right? Yeah, who scary. Do you have an arm like God's, and can your voice thunder like his? No. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> 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 
My, uh, my former high school students know I can get pretty loud if I want, um, but I can't, no, I can't thunder like that. Uh, Yes. No, oh no, absolutely not. Whoa, that rumbled in. Exactly, right? God, God came to Job in the midst of the storm. He came uh, to Elijah with a storm preceding, a, a number of storms preceding him. Whirlwind, earthquake, fire. But God is in the still, soft voice, right? Yeah. God is in mercy. Uh, so God says, do you have an arm like God? Can your voice thunder like his? Okay, well then, adorn yourself with glory and splendor if you're so righteous. If your righteousness is based on the good stuff you've done and the sins you've avoided, then clothe yourself in honor and majesty. But as I look at you, you're uh, almost naked, covered in disease, and sitting in ashes, right? <laughs> Thankfully, that's, God is gracious. He doesn't point that out, right, <laughs> about Job. Oh, Unleash the fury of your wrath and look at every proud man and bring him low. If God is unjust and you know what justice is, then take every proud person out there and humble them. Do it. I dare you, right? Whew. Crush the wicked where they stand. Very, I, I think of um, yeah, I think of all of street corner preachers who preach all the law, all the judgment and condemnation for sins, and it's like okay, yeah, crush all the sinners where they stand if you can, but you can't, right? <laughs> Ooh. That's why I limit myself to the pulpit. Right? <laughs> My call doesn't extend to the the street corner. Then, then, if you're able to do all this, oh, bury them all in the dust together, shroud their faces in the grave. So he's, he's saying, like, okay, give them what they deserve and put them to death. But when you kill them, you got to be perfectly just and righteous about it. Good luck, right? <laughs> because you, you can't, unless you murder them, right? Uh, then, if you do all that, then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Bingo. Right? If you can do all this like I can, then I, God himself, will admit, yes, you've justified yourself. Until we get to that point, we can't say, I'm righteous because I'm good and I don't do these sins. We can't. Right? That's the... The heart. That's the point here. And that's what Job needed to learn, yeah, to take to heart. It's purely by the grace of God. Remember what Satan said all the way at the beginning? Um, when God says, Have you considered my servant Job? And, and Satan says, Does God does Job serve God for nothing? That's his first accusation against Job and against God. Does he just serve you for nothing? The word that's used there in Hebrew is out of grace, freely. Does Job serve you just out of grace for nothing? No, and, and Satan says, no, he wants something out of it. So take that away and he'll curse you, right? Uh, I think that's important to remember too, that that is what Job is rediscovering, the grace. It's all about the grace of God given to us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, God, here, God also confirms a point that Elihu brought up in his speech that we kind of glazed over. Uh, but I think it's important just to remember that God actually kind of confirms exactly what Elihu was saying. I think that's important. I think it shows us Elihu is, is kind of more spot on. I still have read commentary on Elihu that goes either way, that it's like, yeah, he's, he's, he's more right than the other friends, and some that say he's just this pompous fraud, just like all the others. I don't think that's true at all, because he says things that are correct about God, he talks all about the mediator that Job has forgotten. And then God confirms things that he said. We'll see this next week, too. God says, Elihu and the two friends, the other two friends, spoke evil of God. He doesn't say that about Elihu, though. Elihu is left out of that. So I think that's also very important, too. Um, and so to demonstrate Job's lack of power and justice compared to God's power and justice, here we go. God gives us two examples, behemoth and Leviathan. 
Uh, we, we could think of it as total power, right? Because there's the land and the sea. And in Hebrew writing, the land and the sea and all that is in them means all of creation, right? So this is the total picture. Uh, here we go, behemoth and Leviathan. What is behemoth? Whew. That's the million shekel question, right? Is he, here's a few options that have been thrown out there. Is he a hippopotamus? Is he a rhinoceros? A big, you know, land beast that people couldn't control back then? Is he an elephant? Is he a dinosaur? Is he just a myth? Hmm. We'll, we'll consider this when we read his features. What about Leviathan? What is Leviathan? Job brought up Leviathan in chapter 3. We talked a little bit about him then. Uh, but once again, here's some options that have been brought up about what this creature is or was. Uh, a whale? Monster of the sea? Was he a, a crocodile? A megalodon? That's a giant shark now extinct. Has anyone seen that movie, Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus? <laughs> we, you know, we will. We'll find out. Yeah. Well, no, no, we won't. We won't. But yes, we will. <laughs> Was Leviathan also a dinosaur of the sea, or just another um, a myth, a mythic figure? Does Nathan know? Oh, yeah, well, see, I was going to say, uh, is, is Behemoth uh, a dragon and, the, uh, you know, Leviathan the Loch Ness Monster, right? Is this is just a myth, like a story that we've created for ourselves? Our, so the important thing, which is not really an important thing that we need to know, but the Im immediate thing we like to know is, uh, is this, are these things real creatures that existed back then? that possibly still exist today? Are they real or are they just mythological? And the answer to that, which we will reveal, is no. yes. Okay. <laughs> real. Yes, they're real. Yes, they exist. Yes, yes, they are real and yes, they are myth. Yes, they are myth. Oh. Yeah. Okay. They're a real myth. <laughs> The short answer is yes. The long answer is we don't know. But that's okay. We don't need to. We get the point, and we'll talk about that. The, the why God uses these is far more important than the what they are. We don't need to know exactly what they are to really understand God's point. And in fact, the more we're going to see this, the more we try to figure it out and categorize them and understand them, the less we miss the point that God is making, that we don't know anything, right? So that's what I want you to take away with when thinking about behemoth and leviathan. I think the more we try to figure out exactly what they were, the less we're listening to God. The more we're missing the point. Because God is using them to say, you don't know things. You have no control. You can't categorize these things, right? But didn't Job have to have some knowledge of either the myth or the reality yeah. yep. in order to be scared? Yes. In order to understand what God is talking about, yeah. And Job, as I said, uses the Leviathan as an example himself. Um, and so, uh, in some cases in Scripture, Behemoth and Leviathan are both talked about as a real animal God created. In Job here, it'll say, uh, look at Behemoth, whom I formed, along with you. So just as Job is real, so behemoth is a real creature that Job understands. Elsewhere in Psalm 104, Psalm 104, it's mentioned that God formed, created the Leviathan. So there's some real animal in mind when the authors write this. However, the real created animals that they had in mind at that time are not the limit to what behemoth was or leviathan was. The same way when we talk about dragon today, we could mean a Komodo dragon. That's a real created animal. But there's also this whole other symbolic significance, mythological significance that goes along with it. I think it's something similar to that. There is a real created animal in mind, but that's not the limit of what this means when God brings it up. Um, and uh, Leviathan, in Isaiah 27, Leviathan is used as a myth, a mythic creature, because it's all of the, the wicked nations that God will punish 
It's the evil God will defeat on the last day, the day of the Lord, right? So there he's not talking about a real creature because God, on the last day, we have nowhere else in scripture that God is going to come down with a vendetta against one of his created sea beasts and just kill it. No, right? No, uh, no. <laughs> so it's, it's both, right? There's a real created creature in mind sometimes, but other times it's a myth. Uh, we do the exact same thing with animals, with language as a whole, but with animals. We might say the informant was a rat. We don't mean the FBI was getting information from a rodent, right? <laughs> we talk, call someone a rat because they have characteristics of a rat in a, a symbolic way, right? Um, it's dishonorable, it's dirty, right? It jumps ship when the ship is sinking. That's a rat. Uh, Jesus does this. He calls the ruler, the Tetrarch Herod, a fox. He says, go tell that fox. Jesus does not believe that there's a fox sitting on the throne, right, um, that is asking to see him. He's, say, he's calling him a fox because it's sly, it's crafty, but most importantly of all, the fox was an unclean animal to Jewish society. So he's sly, foxy, and unclean. Uh, you, you could ask a U of M student, what are you? And they would say, a wolverine. And that's a perfectly reasonable response, right? You could ask Hugh Jackman the same question, what are you? And he could say Wolverine with a perfectly reasonable response for far different reasons, right? So the point is we could have a real thing in mind and yet it could have symbolic meaning as well. So I don't think it, it's too difficult to, to think of Behemoth and Leviathan in those terms. Um, it's better to focus on why behemoth and leviathan are used as examples rather than figuring out what they are. You'll see that both of these creatures, when they're described by God, are described in very exaggerated terms, using hyperbole, which is overstating something to, to prove your point. That's what Jesus uses when he says, cut off your arm, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, right? <laughs> uh, I clearly either I didn't follow those instructions, or I, I'm without sin, so that's great. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't mean mutilate yourself, right? Because that would break the fifth commandment, right? Do no harm, do no violence against uh, a human body, right? Um, oh, no, I lost myself in my words. <laughs> uh, so you'll see that there's very poetic terms, exaggeration used, it is very a very far cry. Even though these might be, there might be a created animal in mind. It would take a big stretch of the imagination to think God is actually describing real physical details about both of these creatures. There's poetry. There's exaggeration. That's part of God's point. He's overwhelming Job with poetry. Have you ever been there in poetry class in high school? I mean, it just goes on and on. And you're like. All this poetry, oh goodness. That's what God is, he's, he's making the point, you don't understand this, you can't comprehend it, it's so far beyond you in so many different ways, right? Uh, and so he's, he, he overwhelms Job with this eloquent, exaggerated poetry to show the overwhelming extent of jo Job's own ignorance, right? So how then can he correct God and what has been done? How can he justify himself apart from God, right? And so these represent, un, do I have this? I do. They represent uncontrollable, incomprehensible forces of God's creation that we have no power over and no way of understanding. So that's why I say, I think the more we try to say, oh, the, the Leviathan was a whale or a crocodile and the behemoth was a brontosaurus, or no, they're not brontosauri anymore. They went the way of Pluto, I guess. Um, the more we try to figure it out, the, I think the, the more we miss God's point. We're not supposed to figure it out because we can't to some degree, right? Uh, so that is, I think, something to keep in mind. Let's read the Lord's words here. For starting with uh, verse 15. He's just said, if you're able to do all this powerful, great, wonderful stuff, then I, I myself will say, your, right, your own right hand can save you. And here he picks up verse 15. Look at the behemoth, for example. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you, right? So there's some created animal in mind. And which feeds on grass like an ox. 
what strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. So there, that's poetry, right? There's no animal that has bronze for bones. I don't think. <laughs> his limbs like rods of iron. He ranks first among the works of God, yet his maker can approach him with his sword. That's the point. This creature that is the most powerful, most unknowable, the first in all of the created cosmos, yet God can just cut his head off if he wants, right? The hills bring him their produce and all the wild animals play nearby. Under the lotus plant he lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. Oh, you know, hippopotamus, that brings to mind. The lotuses conceal him in their shadow. The poplars by the stream surround him. When the river rages, he is not alarmed. The even inanimate creation, even a raging river does not terrify this thing. Yet, when God just walks at him with a sword, he's, he's trembling in his hooves. His, his, the iron bones melt within him, right? He is secure, though the Jordan should surge against his mouth. Can anyone capture him by the eyes or trap him and pierce his nose? No. I mean, God can, right? Uh, and so that's the, the behemoth, right? All of the ways you, you, cannot, you have no power over the first of God's creation and can't understand it, yet God can just, you know, come and go as he pleases. He knows it perfectly. Chapter 41, can you, pull, can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? When you go fishing, you know, is Leviathan going to be out there and you, to, for you to reel in, you know? Um, I've been fishing a number of times, never happened once yet. Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Can you make him your own, right, and then lead him along? Will he keep begging you for mercy? Even if you could do those things, would he, would he be in your power? Would he beg you for mercy? No way. Will he speak to you with gentle words? Right? Will he compliment you and fawn over you with gentle words? Will he make an agreement with you for you to take him as your slave for life? <sighs> Even if, if that is a whale, think of the blue whale. I think that's the largest mammal on earth. Uh, is he going to sign on the dotted line to be your, your pet in your aquarium at home? <laughs> Can you make a pet of him like a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? You see, like a little Pomeranian, you know? That you can... <laughs> Will traders barter? And I think, like, I think God is being funny here. I mean, I think so. God is a really, he's really funny at times. Um, and, and really not funny at other times, but I think he's being, like, he's exaggerating, right? He's making the point, this is ridiculous, this is ludicrous. Uh, can you fish his hide? No. Can you, will traders barter for him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his hide with harpoons and his head with fishing spears? That's where it's probably not a whale, right? They did exactly that to whales, uh, you know. Until whales were almost extinct. To, you know, there's great descriptions of it in this book, which you can check out at your local library. <laughs> if you lay a hand on him, he, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Uh, oh, yeah, that's an, another thing in this book. A captain uh, tries to lay a hand on the white whale, Moby Dick, and he, he gets his leg cut off or you know, bit off by the whale's jaw. And Ahab. And, uh, his, you know, to, to put it mildly, his life was never the same after that. <laughs> Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse him. Who then is able to stand against me? Oh, you think Leviathan is bad. Whew. Who has a claim against me that I must pay? And yet he does. And yet God does pay. He pays the price. He takes on flesh and blood and pays that flesh and blood. Oh, man. Wow. Everything under heaven belongs to me. I will... <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> We're not done yet, Joe. I will not fail. By the way, one more thing. Uh, that's, what was that, Columbo? Just one more question. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Just one more thing, Joe. By the way, I will not fail to speak of his limbs, his strength, and his graceful form. 
Not only is he powerful, he's beautiful, elegant, graceful. Who can strip off his outer coat? Who would approach him with a bridle? Who dares open the doors of his mouth, ringed about with fearsome teeth? Maybe it's the kraken, you know? That's also a myth. Uh, His back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next there that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. His snorting throws out flashes of light. His eyes are like rays of dawn. They are once again, you know, exaggerated, clearly. Um, Unless there was an animal that existed then that could shoot light beams from his eyes like the dawn, right? Uh, Smoke pours from his nostrils as from a boiling pot over a fire of reeds. His breath sets coals ablaze and flames dart from his mouth. Strength resides in his neck. Dismay goes before him. The folds of his flesh are tightly joined. They are firm and immovable. His chest is hard as rock, hard as a lower millstone. That's the, you know, the, the bottom millstone that the, the top stone you know, rolled over and ground everything up on. When he rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before his thrashing. The sword that reaches him has no effect, nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron he treats like straw and bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make him flee. Slingshots are like chaff to him. Boy, slingshots were not like chaff to Goliath, this big, strong, powerful man. And yet here it's just like chaff in the wind. A club seems to him but a piece of straw. He laughs at the rattling of the lance. His undersides are jagged potsherds, shards of pottery, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge. Even the earth bows before him, right, as he makes paths in the mud. He makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him he leaves a glistening wake. One would think the deep had white hair. Whoa, that's cool. I like that. Nothing on earth is his equal, a creature without fear. He looks down on all that are haughty. He is king over all that are proud. Those who are proud and haughty and lift themselves up, what can you do about Leviathan? How can you lift yourself up above him? And you think that is bad. What about God, right? How can you lift yourself up to heaven? Through Pride didn't work for Satan. How can you lift yourself up to heaven through works, through good works, building your soul up to heaven, earning God's favor, right? The point is you can't, right? It's so beyond your control. Don't try, right? There's full righteousness, full forgiveness for all your sins. Once again, because there's a a mediator, a go-between. We can't lift ourselves up to heaven, so heaven comes down to us, dwells with us, lives and dies and rises again for us and ascends and brings us with when he ascends into heaven to fill heaven and earth, to sit at the right hand of God. I think we'll leave it there for now. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Yeah, so next week uh, we'll, we'll conclude everything. We'll look at chapter 42 conclude the book, conclude what we know of Job and his restoration, and then uh, I'll leave you with some final thoughts to take away with on the whole book of Job. When you think of Job in the future, remember these main points about it, and you'll be all set. Any questions uh, for today? You did a good job. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. We actually got through two words. Yeah, we did. We got through it all. I got my, for Behemoth and Leviathan, I, Museum of the Weird, you know, Bigfoot and Loch Ness, right? All right, I think no more questions. We will uh, uh, close with a prayer together. Dear Father in heaven, thank you once more for gathering us together around your word. You, you have gathered all uh, of creation, all the waters of the sea, all the stars of the sky into your hands, and you have such grace for us that you gather us, your people, around you in your word and sacraments. And we thank you for that. We give you praise and glory for that. We ask you to use this word to keep us in this faith, the faith of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. See you next week for the last time.